Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to Fab Collab's Curtain Call series. My name is Tamari Lana, and I'm your host for this week. And I co-host the series every you know second week with my co-host Leah Granger. And we have the honor, oh hello, hello. We have the honor of hosting women in the performing arts industry every single week and talking to them about their lives, their careers, their struggles, their dreams, what they're working on. And we've been going since uh, November, every single week, featuring someone in the, in the industry. And I'm so excited about today because one of my biggest idols, yes you are, is gonna be live with us today. And her name is Lisa Dwan. Now, just a quick intro before she comes on, although she probably doesn't need an intro, but you know, she can speak for herself. But Lisa Dwan is an incredible actress and even a kind of a singer, right? We'll get into that. But primarily an actress, a dancer, just a beautiful person that I've had the honor of, of speaking with and, and meeting um, over the past few years. So I'm just gonna take a second here to invite her on while people join. And again, welcome to Curtain Call. My name is Tamari Lana. I'm your host for today. And here we go. I'm gonna just send you a review is, is accept it. There we go. Oh, oh my God. Hi, I can't believe that works. Hi. How <laughs> are you? Lisa. I'm well, so I, much I can better. I'm the book. I feel yeah, yeah, let's adjust. Here with my you gotta books. adjust here. How's that? There we go. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? I'm Everybody. good. How are you? I'm so much happier now that I can see you live. <laughs> really. Oh, hi, everybody. Welcome. My name is Tamara Elena. This is Lisa Dwan. And we're just going to do a quick chat and interview with her today. Um, so welcome. Welcome to Curtain Palm. And we've been doing this series since November, every week featuring a different woman in the performing arts industry. So today is Lisa Dwan, incredible actress, as I just mentioned, and just person that I'm just so excited to talk to you and to meet. So what's up, Lisa? How are you? I've, I just started tidying my desk, actually, while you're talking. <laughs> we don't see your desk, you know, we don't see it. There's only one camera here. I know you're used to multiple angles. We only, we only have one here. I'm good, love. How are you? I'm pretty good. Life is crazy. But I, I know you know that because you're always flying across oceans and doing crazy things. So where are you calling from now? Right now, I'm in my office, soon to be nursery, um, uh, in Hampstead in London. And um, I'm, I'm about three weeks away from my due date. I'm having a little baby girl. And um, I just finished um, a six-week run of a, more or less a one-woman play, although I did have an amazing Willie, but um, Samuel Beckett's Happy Days, and um, that just finished on Sunday. So wow. I'm, um, um, and then I'm I'm preparing to do a a, a reading of um, Emily Wilson's The Odyssey this Sunday for Jermaine Street Theatre. Oh and, my goodness! Um, and, do you ever yeah. stop? Well, I this is me stopped actually, um, and uh, I'm loving it. I just agreed to write a piece before the baby as well. So, um, I, I, before? I, you said three I, weeks. You said three weeks. Three weeks, yeah. So you have three weeks. What are you writing? Um, it's a review of the Beckett notebooks, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to talking about that um, wow. I'd like to write as well um, and it's a lovely it's a lovely come down um, from performing you know mm. yes. um, so yeah so yeah. you are basically <laughs> saying that your downtime is writing a review <laughs> about to birth a baby in three weeks before redoing a reading of the odyssey that's your <laughs> and an interview right now this is your downtime and I'm I'm avoid it's all to avoid transforming my office into a nursery. <laughs> uh -oh. When are you going to do that? When are you doing that? Um, if you saw the other side of this room, you'd see it's half in construction. Um, one half has baby clothes, and um, yeah, it's exciting. It's all very. I'm exciting. so happy and excited lucky. for you. Yeah. I can't wait. Yeah. I'm yeah. going to have to come meet the baby. I'm so excited. I know. I'm so excited for you. So oh happy. Oh my god, you can sing like her lullaby. Anytime. Anytime. Oh anytime. 
You can sing her a lullaby, though. <laughs> <laughs> I had to sing in this part recently. And oh, my I, God. I couldn't stop okay, talking so about it. We do you. have to tell yeah. that story. Let's just tell it quickly okay. before we dive into things. I, okay, it's really funny. so I... There's always the joke in the family I came from that I couldn't sing and certainly couldn't stay in key. And um, I, I have been specialising in Samuel Beckett's work and touring the world for years. Um, and um, I didn't want to become just purely known as a Beckett actress. So I started to accept everything that came my way. And I got this phone call um, from uh, this writer, a friend of mine said he was um, doing a musical in Toronto and could I sing? And I went, yeah, 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 I can, I can sing. And he went, oh, that's great. I thought you might be able to. I'll just call you back in a bit. And then he calls me back and he says, Lisa, the musical director wants to know what your voice is. And I was walking down the street with a friend of mine and I put the phone on mute saying, sorry, I, I can't quite hear you. And I said, what's a true your voice? actress, a true actress right there. <laughs> and she said, what's your voice? And I went, your singing voice. What voice is it? Because I knew she had sung. And uh, she said, I'm a mezzo. And I went, thank you. Uh, I'm a mezzo. <laughs> I'm not even a mezzo, as it turns out. I'm an alto or so I have no idea what I am actually. <laughs> um, sometimes. But um, I was then flown to Toronto. And um, I thought, you know, I'll just wing it. How hard can it be? You know, how hard can it be? And um, I went into rehearsal the first day and it was the strangest rehearsal room I'd ever seen because it had these musical stands with music on it. And everyone was You mean a normal rehearsal them. room? You mean a normal, in my, in my experience? In your world, but that, that just doesn't happen. We sit around and we read the script, you know? And um, there was no script, it was all songs. Uh -oh. And um, I just behaved like I did in school. I started chewing pens and they were bursting and, and a nervousness with ink all down my tongue and, and shirt. I, I just didn't know what I was going to do. And, um, and, you know, we have a mutual friend, Leslie, and in true kind of Canadian hospitality, she said, why are you staying in a hotel? Come stay in my house. Stay yeah. in my house. It'll be like a home. And I arrived at her house, just sheet white pale, saying, I am in serious trouble. <laughs> I had no idea. I had just bitten off far more than I can chew. I blagged far more than I can chew. And then call in tomorrow. <laughs> and, and you guys arrived around at the house and taught me every song and worked on it every night and showed me how to sing, how to stay in key, how to get from one key to another key, which I didn't even wow. know how to do, like wow. everything. Wow. And I ended up performing the piece. Which and I never about, saw. Thank you, God. You um, wouldn't let me come. No, I was dying. But about a year later, I was performing in Washington and I, I met this woman who runs a theater there called Molly. Uh, she runs Arena Stage. And she said, oh, my God, I saw you perform in a musical in Toronto. You were great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so did it work? So it worked? Like you, I, 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 yeah, there's got to be some footage. I, but then the funny thing is, you know, I, I had to sing in Happy Days. And... Um, all of your notes back then were ringing in my ears. So actually, wow. you've been in my mind quite wow. a lot of late. Yeah. That's yeah. so beautiful. Well, call me anytime. <laughs> Remember, we even we even made a, like a little a little song for you with Stacy. We're like, call Stacy. Or like, got cast in a musical? Don't yeah. know what you're doing? <laughs> call Stacy and tomorrow. And tomorrow. <laughs> I hope Stacey's on here listening to that. <laughs> she was fantastic. And was um, and you had another friend who came around as well. Andrew, Andrew. Time. Yeah. Andrew came around and everyone just joined in. It became this kind of community project. And we'd <laughs> you were, have you were like... the community project? <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Who does that? It was fantastic. We'll come back and we'll do it all again. Yeah, I, I with, hope so. With little baby. Yeah. With little baby yeah. in tow. <laughs> <laughs> well, congrats. I'm glad you got through that musical. I always wonder, I'm like, how did it actually go? So it's yeah. not going well. All things considered. I guess so, yeah. 
I'm so yeah. glad that was helpful. <laughs> so that's how I met Lisa <laughs> in an emergency situation, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you also like did like a, as a thank you. I remember a, a, you say my notes are in your head, but you're like your whole presence has been in my mind ever since that day. But when you like as a thank you recited a little bit of I believe which one was it? It was not I. No, no yes, yeah, not yeah, I. yeah, yeah. Not I. It's this one woman oh, there's monologue. Oh, Andrew. Yes, he is here. We hi, just, Andrew. We hi. We counted the story. Yeah. I remember Andrew teaching me how to play the trumpet as well. Yeah, something happened with that. Yeah. yeah. I'm surprised <laughs> I didn't blag my way as a trumpet player after that. Somewhere. Hey, you know. you, yeah. I wouldn't put it past you. I wouldn't put it past you. <laughs> True improvisation. <laughs> So, yeah. yeah, and you regaled us with, with like a little re like rec recitation of, of uh, Nantai. And I just remember like being absolutely blown away just like with the power, your power and yeah. beauty. You know, no lighting, yeah. no nothing, just you in a room. And I was like, <sighs> yeah. So thank you even now for all of those. And so many people are saying hi. We just got to recognize. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Hello. Hi, Lisa. How's Top hi. going? We're, well, we can get into that. We can get into that. And oh, yeah. my mom says she wrote her thesis when she was pregnant with me and you sound like her. Yeah, there's lots of nice, nice comments on here for you, Lisa. Ah, of sweet. But I want to go like way back because your, your whole life has been an incredible career, like starting from, <laughs> you know, the age of what, 13? Did, didn't you get oh. cast, didn't you get accepted into a ballet? Ba well, first of all, let's go even further back. Sorry, for those of you who don't know Lisa, where are you from? I'm Irish. I'm from the centre of Ireland, um, a town called Athlone. And um, I first started doing ballet when I was three. And um, no, my father was an amateur. I know. <laughs> um, my father was an amateur actor and all my aunts and uncles were amateur actors. And so right. the stage was always talked about with a kind of similar reverence to... Mm. Um, let's say church in a way, wow. you know, um, and, and just under the lights was, it was, it was, it was made um, clear to me wow. amazing things could happen. Wow. And so I, that's all I ever wanted. Uh, and um, wow. at the age of 12, I, I was chosen to dance with Rudolf Nureyev when he came to dance um, wow. with the Cleveland San Jose Ballet Company in a production of Capelia still one of my favorite ballets and he was playing Dr. Capelius and it was two years before he died and I suppose as a publicity wow. stunt um, they, they you know put out a kind of nationwide casting call mm -hmm. um, to find a young dancer to dance with him and um, and I was chosen and um, wow. I didn't know who he was for me it was just an opportunity to, to eat McDonald's in um, the Metropolitan <laughs> Um, of um, wow. of Dublin, um, so I was I, I was on the stage, I guess, more or less from about then, and yeah. um, I became a ballet dancer. I went to ballet school in England, and then the cartilage went and bought my knees, and I mm -hmm. um, kind of came back, kind of crashing to Ireland. And um, someone said, "Well, you're a dwan. You must be able to act. Um, why don't you audition for this Shakespeare play?" Um, wow. coming up and I got cast in As You Like It mm -hmm. and um, and an agent was in the audience that night and sent me for two auditions, three auditions in Dublin and I got all three and then I moved to Dublin and next thing I was a warrior princess in an American TV series I watched that I was that. in a Walt <laughs> I watched that <laughs> I was a Walt Disney um, uh, in Oliver Twist uh, with Richard Dreyfuss and Elijah Wood and wow. a, a theater production of James Joyce's The Dead. And that was my kind of entry onto the stage. And wow. I kept thinking a few years later, shouldn't I, shouldn't I train? Shouldn't I? And people were saying, you're working. That's the best yeah. training. Well, your life, your life. Was um, so, yeah. And you, I just want to, mentioned to people that I believe, tell me Lisa if this is correct, that you actually dropped out of school to pursue these things, right? Yeah, well, not consciously. I mean, uh, um, <laughs> by mistake, I, <laughs> you're like, well, maybe you just didn't have time to go, Well, right? no one was watching me. Uh, you know, I was 14 <laughs> living in England in ballet school and um, no one really was paying attention if I was going to school or not. So I didn't go. 
and um wow. and so it's kind of it is weird how my life then ended up brushing with academia so much that's what yeah that's what um, i want to get yeah. to eventually i did go back and Bio. finish school later on in life okay. yeah as an adult but it at the wow. time no i i, I just dropped out <laughs> you're like well i'm just not gonna go <laughs> <laughs> i mean it makes sense living by yourself 14 you're like acting already we have a question here from leah my co-host for curtain call were you nervous i guess in that big those big first shows yeah, I think stage fright has been something I've I've now really, you know, just reflecting again how all the coping mechanisms I've learned from my peers over the mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. and and from kindly angels, a bit like our encounter, you know, who've come into my life and showed me breathing mm -hmm. techniques or meditation techniques or yoga <laughs> techniques or, you know, all of, you know, I've been so fortunate I mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just one lucky girl. I run into these angels, basically, who come and give me lessons mm -hmm. all along. Wow. And um, when I started, I had horrific stage fright. And particularly when I started doing solo work, my stage fright was yeah. almost crippling. But wow. I that was um, coached and nourished and... Um, and and given really fantastic techniques to deal with it. And um, so I'm always nervous, but I just, my, my techniques and my toolbox is wow. bigger than my nerves, yeah. Wow. And what, can I ask you, what's like the biggest technique that helps you the most? You know, someone else, there's a singer here in, in, in uh, Toronto, I don't know if she's on right now, but she did write me and ask me yesterday, Kaya Cater, wonderful folk and banjo player over here. Um, and she, she wanted to actually ask this question. She's like, can you ask Lisa what her biggest coping mechanism is for getting over stage meditation. <laughs> meditation meditation yeah i'm very it's so funny when i'm not performing all of my fantastic self-care routines fall away but when i'm performing i'm i'm like an athlete you know i'm very conscious about the food i eat about the mm. amount of caffeine i have about the amount of sleep i have and if mm. i can't get enough sleep which pregnancy definitely um <laughs> um it does it does affect your sleep then i make sure i'm prioritizing meditation and i mm -hmm. meditate um twice sometimes three times a day um wow. and i find that is the best particularly for the type of work i do you know a one woman bekettian monologue you know that's about two hours long so to remember all of that i can't have my thoughts being invaded and um, so um, I try and still my mind as much as possible. So as many brain cells and um, the remaining haggard few are wow. available for wow. me um, when I'm working. That's wow. a big one. And, and the other thing I remember saying years ago to an actor, does it ever go? Does it ever stop? And he said, you know what? No, but you do set a precedence for yourself. Mm. Well, the last time I thought I was going to die, I didn't. And the last time I thought I was going to choke, I didn't. And the last time I right. thought I wouldn't be able to catch right. my breath, you know. And so right. just the more you do it. Um, That's so hard And then I, I also kind of think techniques to get out of your own way. And so I think of what we do as a kind of act of service, as a kind of mm -hmm. prayer almost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so if you can get into that zone, you're mm -hmm. laughing. When you're mm -hmm. so absorbed with self, um, that, can be, um, that can be difficult to wrangle. Mm -hmm. um, but if you put yourself in a position where you can be a sort of vehicle um, for yes. a creative flow or a talent or or a message, uh, you know, um, then I think, I, I think that's a very good place to get over yourself from. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've read so many things, actually so many statements about you saying that you are basically that perfect vehicle, particularly for Beckett. I know you don't want to be only Beckett. You're not only Beckett. I didn't meet you in a Beckett scenario. <laughs> I, bet you're well, oh, oh, I also met this amazing guy before a tour in America and I was very 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 nervous about taking my Beckett's to BAM 
um, mm -hmm. back then and I was tired and when you're tired you can't negotiate I had just finished a very long tour mm -hmm. and with the one woman stuff you're in your own head all the time but I met this amazing guy and I thought I was going to meet him to treat my neck mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, his name is Mojo and mm -hmm. he said you know what your problem is you don't breathe properly and so he taught me all these breathing techniques as well yeah. Yeah. And, and so yeah. breathing and yoga and meditation and wow. just getting into your body and, and trusting that your body has its own intelligence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, staying so much up in your mind. Certainly, um, I'm behind e enemy lines um, when I'm up there. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the biggest thing that changed for me when I kept losing my voice singing a few years ago and I had to relearn how to breathe. That was the biggest thing. Yeah. Spent a year yeah. like learning how to breathe, basically. I know. You kind of think, hey, I'm 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 in my forties. I've got it now. Yeah. I thought I figured this out decades ago. <laughs> yeah. And like turns out I knew nothing. And it, yeah, it completely exactly. changed everything and then like even yawning, you know, like different things to open your airways, like ten minutes yeah. yawning. You know? Yeah. And like you, yeah. all your sinuses open, everything opens, and then you're just a whole other. Well, Mojo, vehicle. Mojo attached me to this machine and showed me, demonstrated how we can actually change our own blood chemistry by breathing. It's so powerful. Wow. And um, and I found that amazing and very empowering. Very empowering when you know the nerves. I didn't know what nerd you know in the past i used to have a brandy or two before going on stage and then i stopped drinking about 14 years ago and i didn't know what i was gonna do to calm mm -hmm. down and mm -hmm. i didn't even know really what nerves could do to the body uh -huh. and I, this fantastic actor who also used to suffer from stage fright and he's, he's an amazing actor bill mm -hmm. um you know, my my stage fright would manifest like um, a hypochondria. I'd say, but Bill, um, I, I have this headache, and I think I think I'm having a stroke. <laughs> and he'd say, oh, okay, yeah, I I get those; they're terrible. Well, and I'm not saying that isn't going to happen. By the way, I'm no doctor. But what are you going to do until that happens? Uh. Um. I'm going to say my lines. That's it, kiddo. That's it, kiddo. And then I, I rang him back literally a minute later. And then the other thing, I forgot to mention this to you, but this is even more important. Um, I have a hernia. And and I do, actually. And I said, and it really hurts. And I'm just really worried about it. And he said, okay, well, well, what's the worst that could happen? Well, it could burst and I could choke on my own vomit. And he went, okay, I'm not saying that isn't going to happen. But what are you going to do until that happens? I'm going to say my lines. Oh my That's god, I'm getting goosebumps with this. <laughs> Call me after the show, he'd say. <laughs> and um um and and so yeah, just learning all these techniques to get out of wow. your head and that your head isn't your friend and, and just how nerves can bring on so many things. Panic attacks. I suffered from panic attacks for years and they're so convincing. You know, I'm so I was so convinced I had a, you know, very, very unique heart problem or you know right, right, and, right, and right. I have this he's got this very droll voice bill and so he explained that to me he was like this is stage fright kiddo first the bowels will go then you think you'll have cancer you do not have cancer then you think you're losing your voice you're not losing your voice so I hear him in my head like a mantra when I'm putting on my makeup at night and stage you know first the bowels will go then you think you'll have cancer <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and next thing you know, I'm calling him on the way home in a cab going, I did it. And he went, wow. good on you, kiddo. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for telling us this. Guys, this is what Lisa's <laughs> thinking on right before you're about to see her walk on stage. Now you know. <laughs> <laughs> the secrets are out. Oh, my God, Lisa, you're incredible. You've had all these angels, but you have to be open, I think, to seeing the, these angels, accepting their teachings listening being open right it doesn't take not everybody would like come to toronto for a musical first of all not everyone would come to toronto for a musical just and saying. lie and say because <laughs> yeah. i'm gonna call it improvisation but <laughs> but you know and then like accept people that you didn't even know coming to the house and and telling you how to do your own part and having like so much experience like not everyone would accept that right and all these angels and stuff coming your way so yeah you've had a lot of angels and like stars aligned but I also have to say, like, you've, you've brought them, you know, you've been open to that, I think. I had one amazing experience 
back when I was living in Galway when the knees had first gone. Mm, I walked past um, I walked past this Charlie Burns bookstore. Mm-hmm. And there was a book by Patsy Rodenberg. I'd urge anyone who uses their voice for a living to read. Um, the actor speaks. And I bought it for £3.50. And um, it's this black book. And while reading it, I was thinking, wow, imagine, imagine being an actor in London and standing on the Old Vic stage. And, you know, this was the stage of Gilgood and Laurence Olivier and all the greats, you know. And, and, and I, I was thinking about it, and I don't know is this manifestation or what, it, you know, but I remember just being wowed by her and the, the whole, the, the technique and the relationship mm-hmm. between the voice and the text and, you know, the performer. And, and I, I adored this book and wow. it was a bit of a Bible for me. Mm. Cut to three, four years ago, I'm doing a one woman show of my own adaptation of Beckett's work on the old Vic stage. And it's a big thousand seater, you know, so, you know, it's got an overhang that you need to hit the back. Um, and Matthew Warkus, the artistic director, came to um, one of the last rehearsals and he said, you know, it's a big old barn. And I know you don't want to be, you know, you want Mike or artificial help. And he said, but why don't we just bring in um, someone just to help you with your voice? And mm-hmm. I thought that would be great. Mm-hmm. And in walks Patsy Rodenberg. That woman no. who wrote that book all those years ago. No. And and I no, remember she on. walked Yeah, I swear to God, she walked right up to me and put her hands on my womb. And she said, All the work is there. You just have to pull everything up into your womb because that's the source of everything. And I can still feel her. I'm getting goosebumps myself with her hands on my on my um on my on my womb. And uh, wow. particularly now. And um and she has become a very close mentor and friend since. And even when I was performing a piece in Dublin and having a difficult time, she got on a plane on her own steam to come and support me. And she's wow. just that kind of woman. She's extraordinary. Wow. So, I, I, you know, whatever it is, I've had a very lucky path with running into people <laughs> like you and Patsy and, you know, um, Wow, yeah. Lisa. That's so beautiful. Well, I'll get on a plane anytime. Just call me. I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. <laughs> Tomorrow I did it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> One day I'm going to call you for a musical specifically. And Alina here, our beautiful girl who does all our socials, says, I'm going to need to, and she's also an incredible singer. She says, I'm going to need to bookmark this, this uh, interview for any time I'm feeling stage fright. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I'll just keep that in your head. It is, it is stage fright. So Lisa, how on earth can I, I'm sure you've been asked this a million trillion times, but I've never asked you this. How on earth did you get from, you know, ballet? I mean, I know what happened in ballet, but how did you land on Beckett and becoming like the kind of vehicle for that? Um, so I was in this very embarrassing TV series. I was a warrior princess in an American TV series. That was my first yeah, job. Man, nothing wrong with being a so warrior So I was princess. like, okay, yeah. Well, apart from uh, wearing a leotard and boots running around the fields of Ireland covered in clothing like and cattle time. excrement. Yeah, in I like February in horizontal wow. rain. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, but it was hilarious. And I did 56 episodes and talk about a training ground. But, you know, they hired all these Irish actors who were like great thespians, like fantastic actors. But we didn't realize that kind of, it was Fox television and Saban entertainment. And they were, you know, twisting the narrative to suit the toys. So I was like a Happy Meal doll and I was a theme park in Florida. I was a Wellington boot and a pencil case and a spaghetti o And um, you have it all, Lisa. You have it all. Yeah. What can I um, Where is my doll? Actually, it is somewhere. Oh Princess Deirdre. Hey, yeah. Let's see if I can find the doll. It's Princess Deirdre. Hey, Steph. Hi, everyone. Okay. I cannot believe. <laughs> I'm showing you this, but this yes. is my doll. Yeah. 
That's um, amazing. Yeah, oh my God. I know. It's hysterical. It's hysterical. You have it for your daughter now. How perfect. Oh, cheapers. Um, <laughs> anyway, Stephen Brennan, who played my father in the series, um, is a great Beckett actor and played um, one of the, the one of the best lookies it. that I've ever seen. And that year, they were committing the gay theatre, all of Beckett's theatrical works, for the stage to film mm. and I was asked would I work on a piece with Stephen because they mm -hmm. needed someone who could move in rhythm to the music who Got it. you know Your dancing and comes into play exactly that. so um I I I obliged and then I was exposed to Beckett mm. and so you know I had just moved to Dublin the year before I was mm -hmm. a warrior princess so my bar and my benchmark when I came to theatre was Beckett mm. and uh, I got to see all of those plays wow. and then one night or one day I should say and I remember the moment it was on Baggett Street Bridge in the year 2000 Stephen turned to me and told me about Not I not I is that play that I recited for you, but in the actuals, and I performed in Canadian stage actually for a month. Um, it, it's an entirely blackened out auditorium. So, I mean, I had to totally seduce the fire marshals there, but you take out the, the, the exit signs and you, you know, oh, you right. can't even see your hand in front of your face. It's that black. And up appears in front of you, eight foot above the stage, so it doesn't appear like a tall person. Um, and, and eight foot so it doesn't feel like something is hanging right bang in the middle of the stage is a disembodied mouth, just a mouth, speaking a monologue at the, speak, uh, at the speed of thought and with kind of a ferocious cacophonous rhythm because um, it isn't just one voice, it's kind of almost, as you remember, a multitude, multitude of voices in one. Um, and it was Beckett putting the mind on stage. And even though the mouth, because my head is in a head harness, is locked completely still, um, the mouth appears because of the sensory deprivation in the audience to float or osculate around the auditorium. And everyone in the audience experiences that differently. Some, so some people think they see it flying around, you know. And so um, I... I was amazed and you know still to this day I have never seen a version of that play the only visual reference I have is the one that Stephen Brennan painted on my imagination on wow. Baggett Street Bridge in 2000. Wow. I am um, I have only ever performed it and I worked with Billy Whitelaw who first mm -hmm. performed it and she mm -hmm. became my mentor yeah. but I I I didn't know what was about to happen again, this path that I spoke about. He told me that I was absolutely dumbfounded, but I struggled at the time to get seen or taken seriously in Dublin. Why is that? Um, well, well, why do you think? One, one was a sort of Irish Harvey Weinstein figure. Mm. And the other was, um, was, um, I was considered a TV actress mm. and therefore not capable of stage. You know, I was blonde and blue eyed and pretty and therefore stupid or lacking a depth or something. God knows, I don't, I don't know, whatever. It, I, you know, dodging people's perceptions of me has been mm. kind of a, a, a ninja-like skill that I've had Warrior to develop. Warrior princess. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, you know now I get a kick out of it but in the past I, I, you just didn't know you were just reaching these blocks you know right, right. Um, and in the past I think I gave more credence to people's opinions uh -huh. and now I just recognize they're people's opinions and not all people are very knowledgeable or smart wow. um, olé, so olé. Um, but it took a long time you know um, mm -hmm. for me to break out of that. So I wasn't going to get any work if I stayed in Dublin, so I had to leave the country. Whoa. And, um, Whoa. and even though that might have seemed like a negative thing, I have to say it was one of the best things that ever happened to me. That yeah. Weinstein character was actually one of the best things that ever happened to me. Oh um, um, and uh, and so I, I moved to London. And 
Mm. I don't know how it happened because I'm not even sure I had an agent at the time. But anyway, I was sent the script of Not I with an audition and time for the next day. And um, I saw the inside of my mind shamelessly splayed open. Um, I saw, you know, it looks like sheet music, actually, if you ever have a look at that, that, because it's three words, then dot, 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 three words, two words, dot, dot, you know, and then a dot and a dot dash. And it's extraordinary. And I could feel the rhythm immediately. And it seemed to be propelling me to speak these words at speed. And um, initially, of course, I thought, oh, Beckett, you know, I'm going to I'm not going to be able to understand this because, you know, mm-hmm. I'm stupid. And um no, and, you're um, not. educate I well, negate course, that right now I know but that was the you know that was what I thought and right. ill-educated and I thought I'd have to call my right. my brother who was a professor to help me but with pressure mounting for the the audition the next day I just sat alone and read and wow. I heard the nuns in the convent I went to when I was a kid I heard the acerbic parochial asides from the streets of Athlone I heard my mother's tender mercies I heard my father I heard that kind of Irish Catholic guilt guilty or not guilty and and I just cast all of those phrases with people I knew in my head right and initially I thought I, I said I thought it can't be this roar this accessible this visceral this immediate this personal can it mm-hmm. And I had that instinct confirmed when one day, I got the part, but one day I um, I was taken to Battersea Park in London to mm-hmm. develop some sensory techniques to yes. help with the memorization of the piece in the park. So I wore a blindfold, so I would get used to being blindfolded in the piece because your head is in a head harness with a blindfold okay. and black makeup. And... Um, I sat down and I would pick up the grass when it came to the parts about the grass and Croker's Acres Mm. and certain things that I would have. Um, But I ended up performing the entire monologue. And when I'd finished, I lifted my eye mask and I realized that I'd collected an audience of park bench drunks who stood there gripping their cans of cider, the, the substance they were using to quieten those voices. Right. And I realized that that's what Beckett was doing. He was putting the mind on stage. Wow. So I went from wow. playing, you know, those TV roles of the blonde, the bitch and the bimbo to getting an opportunity to play consciousness. Wow. And I, I, I was spoiled for life. <laughs> wow. Well, I'm so glad that that happened, that you mm-hmm. did that. It takes a lot of courage. No, really. It's incredible. And what, for those of you who haven't seen any images of this play, please go look them up because it's literally like she says, it's just all black and all you see is this red, red mouth. And you've told me in the past, actually, that that's been quite scary. You've had scary moments playing that, that part. You know, you're roped in, you're tied in. I've seen photos of you like from behind where you're like completely strapped in. You can't move. You're like strapped into this wooden thing on a stage and like you then you and you have to perform. I can't even imagine. I can't even imagine. Plus stage fright, plus everything. Oh my goodness. How do you even do it? Yes, but despite those restrictions, no one has ever given me a role as liberating as that. Hmm. I mean, it's extraordinary to have your body removed as a woman, even your ideas of yourself, to have all of that taken away where you're just left with the essence of who you are was one of the best introductions to myself. I would say Beckett introduced me to myself, my real self, my multiplicity of selves. And that was what was able, I or enabled me to break from the shackles of other people's projections of my own vanity as well, my desire to people please, my, you know, and to go beyond the I that I thought I know. And, and and discover an eye that I didn't, and it changed my vocal register. There, you know, there was one moment I was performing it down in a cave, I agreed to, I mean, I had taken it all around the world. <laughs> I, I don't know why I said yes, but anyway, I was down in a cave performing it and the audience would come in, 27 of them by boat and they'd find me like Batwoman up in the strap. Anyway, it was crazy. But anyway, during that time, spending hours down in a complete pitch black, cave 
something entered my vocal register and I produced a sound that wasn't even human, let alone female. I did not know my body could produce that sound. Mm -hmm. And I had so many epiphanies like that mm -hmm. while performing Beckett. Um, and just, you know, not being able to see because mm -hmm. you're blindfolded, hear because your ears are pressed into this head harness or move because your body is shackled into this wooden box. Not because Beckett was some sort of weird sexual fetishist. No, it, it's just so your light wouldn't move out of, or your mouth wouldn't move out of light. And mm -hmm. that the light is tiny and you're speaking at such speed, your whole body is vibrating to try and produce the sound at such speed. So it's necessary to, to lock your body into one place. And, um, and yet, like anyone who's ever come to see me from behind sees that I'm actually dancing. I'm on my tippy toes. And often after performances, I'd wonder, how did I pull a muscle in my calf, you know, <laughs> or, 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 you know, <laughs> or my buttocks, you know, it, it just, just the amount of intensity it takes to just perform that piece. Um, and then, you know, the audience talk about seeing you float across the auditorium but I too felt like I was floating across wow. the water from you. Almost feel like you're leaving your body. Wow. And just as a woman, having had projections thrown at me since the knee mm -hmm. of how I should look and sound and be, and right. you know, and right. um, and I mean, it's coming in spades again now that I'm pregnant. It seems to be a whole new invitation to the public to make projections on who you are and what kind of mother you should be and what kind of birth you should have. And it's hilarious. But um, it was, it was just one of the most liberating experiences. And that's why I toured for so long. I just mm. couldn't get enough of that mm. uh, freedom. It's almost like a high, you know, yeah. body experience. Yeah. That you're bringing to yourself. Wow. Mm. Oh man, Lisa, you're incredible. So I guess I got you addicted to Beckett. Long story yeah. short. <laughs> oh, he's extraordinary. Yeah. You know, one of my dad's favorites. Yeah. Yeah. And and yeah. I also read that you performed something of his as a woman for the first time. Like you were the first woman to perform something recently. Mm. What was it again? The trilogy? No, it wasn't the trilogy. No, I um I I adapted two of his pieces, but one in particular were Text for Nothing. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Um, they had been performed by um, two males before, but never a woman. Yeah, um, Lisa! So. Woo! <laughs> That's great. So how did you but, go? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. But because he doesn't write characters, per se. Right. He's putting the mind on stage. Got it. Or on the page. Or the multiplicity of or in a creatures. Cave, you, know. you know, yeah, they're, they're, they're creatures. Um, uh -huh. You can meet it with any kind of you know flavor of 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 emotion or character or you know um and and in many ways yes i think beckett is amazing but i'm not like some crazy fangirl either i have to be honest with you and say i have used him as a trojan horse right to tell my truth and to find me in there mm. and um no one else would 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 give me a vehicle like that wow. and um and so that's been amazing and it's made me because he doesn't have narratives there's no stories he's right. not trying to sell us anything there's no there's no story in Becca. there's no like you know? moral of the it's story. just the situation there's no there's not even well there's definitely no morals <laughs> there's no sermon he's he's not trying there's nothing political either he's not trying right. to sell us anything and right. he's you know he's very wary of um uh, you know, emotional gangsters, you know, there's nothing mm -hmm. sentimental, there's nothing fake. It's just the raw human condition, the wound that mm -hmm. he, he manages to touch on yeah. and, um, and, and expresses so brilliantly. And in all of our kind of frailty and loneliness, you know, he's, um, he's extraordinary at that and, um, and creates a space then for us all to find our own wounds, mm -hmm. you know, um, but because there, there's no narratives and I was liberated from narratives for so long, mm -hmm. when I went back to playing normal plays, yeah. Anna and Anna Karenina or even that musical or um, Shining City, Conor McPherson, I realized that the women's roles 
we have a serious problem here and it goes right back to the Greeks. Why um, the women are always crazy um, or the bitch or the bimbo or the psycho. They're parables. And if you think about the very origins of theater where citizens, and I say citizens, I mean the men, the women weren't allowed in the theater. Um, they weren't allowed out of the house and um, had long go to the theater, but the men were paid to attend the theater to learn about troublesome women like Antigone who stands up and speaks truth to power or the foreign mother in Medea who kill your children or Medusa who, you know, we need to cut off her head. And so then I got really obsessed with rewriting the Greeks and uh, working with writers to retell those stories, to go back and put a bit of dignity and flesh on those characters. Because when I saw during the Trump campaign that he, <laughs> sorry, but like, I'm not saying that don't say sorry Trump to me. supporters, all Trump supporters don't have a working knowledge of the Greeks, but Jesus <laughs> they don't. Um, um, but they were using the severed head of Medusa with Hillary Clinton's face yeah, um, superimposed onto it. And so there is a messaging that has been passed on transgenerationally. You read the Daily Mail any day of the week. You look at the kind of the treatment of Meghan Markle, for example, and you see how the immigrant mother is still being treated. And Antigone, you know, look at the kind of slurs that Greta mm. Thunberg has had and other activists, you know, mm -hmm. um, about their sanity. It's always about, we're always, you know, they've been dining out on the crazy ladies since the Greeks, you know, mm. and- um, Have you ever experienced uh, that? Oh, of course. What woman hasn't? Fair. And um, seriously, Fair. and, um, and, um, and so that became a preoccupation for the past few years. And I finally just committed that Antigone and um, that I worked with Colm Tobin in Columbia University yeah. for a year um, to camera during COVID. And it was filmed for the BBC and, um, and working on other collaborations on those, including hoping to work with Margaret Atwood soon on Medea. Yeah, um, cool. but, um, but so that's, that's, that's really been what I've been trying to do is is um use everything Beckett has taught me to attack those narratives and that that would be the only wow. thing I would urge everybody wow. who reads any kind of story or listens to any story ask yourself who's who's benefiting here mm. Mm. and um because narratives are powerful things Wow. And uh, I think we have let the patriarchy control our narratives for long enough. Well said, Lisa. Well, we could end right here, but there's a couple more things I want to get to. What that means is that's like such a good closing statement. But <laughs> that's the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> but so then how did you like, how was it then being in something like Top Gun or these other like super like Top Boy, mainstream, yeah. sorry, Top Boy, yeah, mainstream like, you know, the opposite, literally the opposite of the floating mouth. You know what I mean? Like, how so is that experience? Funny. Well, I loved it. And it was, uh, I was, I was working on the Antigone in Columbia University in New York, crossing campus, heading in to give a lecture. And I get a phone call from the writer, Ronan Bennett. He said, look, I've just written this part that I think you'd be really good at. Um, uh, the Netflix people don't know you, so you're going to have to audition. Do you mind? I was like, hell no. Um, so I, I put an audition on camera. And, you know, she's a feisty. <laughs> Here we go. And um, that's another word that we need to raise an eyebrow over. But anyway, um, but she's, uh, you know, she's a businesswoman and a drug dealer and um, who um, interacts with inner city London life. And um, I saw an awful lot of truth an awful lot of the kids um that are cast and that are cast literally off the street wow and are actual road men um one of my wow. co-stars is a definite road man when everyone was driving past and hacked me going oh Roy, oh Roy, <laughs> trying to get his attention <laughs> i was like are you famous <laughs> in another way um <laughs> and um so i learned a huge amount about truthfulness on screen from mm. my co-stars and that 
And um, and I found it great fun, you know. Um, I I found it super interesting and fascinating and lovely crew. And, you know, um, not a world I was that familiar with. I wasn't even that familiar with Hackney in London either, you know. Right. And so definitely not familiar with any of the music. There was a guy um, from your town, actually, I think, um, uh, and he had this haircut and um drake, and everyone yeah, yeah they told me his from, name a guy was drake. from our town i believe you're talking about drake yeah drake <laughs> was the producer and he showed up at the reading and um i said to my friend um who's your man and uh, she said drake and i went oh, okay okay what does he do and uh love it, love it. <laughs> and love you more they, and more they Lisa. told me about this song and i had been going to um, this same friend had been dragging me to Soul Cycle, um, this kind of insane cycle class. And the first time I went, I, I vomited and had to kind of leave my shoes because I couldn't get the shoes off the bike and crawl out of the oh room. God. And then I was hooked. And um, but um, here's the song that I I did Soul Cycle. She said, "You know that song." And um, oh. this would have been my only exposure to kind of cool music. And um, and so I. Uh, uh, when the minute I saw him, I thought, tap it back, tap it back. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I was sat next to this other artist who's number one. He's absolutely brilliant now that I, I've become a bit more fami familiar with him. But his name is Dave and, and he, he's a fantastic artist. But a lot of the, 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 the grime or the, the, the drill, drill or brill or grill. I can't remember. Anyway, it's one of those. Grill, um, grill, grill, drill, drill music. Anyway, it, it's quite, a lot of the lyrics are quite misogynistic. Mm -hmm. You know, it has to be said. And mm -hmm. so 7.30 in the morning, you're in the makeup chair and they're playing grime, um, stronger versions of grime. Is it brill or drill? Uh, drill, drill, drill music. Um, and it's very, um, you know, roadman, gang focus with a lot of you know questionable lyrics i would say but um trap super cool oh lauren's and, saying are you talking um, about trap music no i think it's okay i think it's it drill i think oh. it's drill well, I'm, I'm so learning embarrassed something i hope nobody right from top I'm voice learning something new. <laughs> and um <laughs> it's not grill drill drill yeah <laughs> and it's not brill it's a fish um anyway uh, it's called drill. Somebody's telling us right now. Sheldon, okay. thank you. Yes, sorry. Anyway, um, I would then leave that chair and go on a plane and fly to America where I would go into the Women and Gender Studies Department and lecture about feminism and narratives and then go back and be hanging out um, with these um, great grime artists. And it was just, it was a fantastic experience to have those two worlds wow. kind of collide wow. um i do remember at jfk getting recognized and someone came up to me and said are you are you that girl from from top boy and i went i am and he said do you mind me asking what you're listening to and i went sure yeah it's yentl <laughs> <laughs> that's what he would be saying <laughs> he's like yentl yeah, you know, Barbara Streisand's gentle. <laughs> just, it just looked like a part of him had died inside. Well, maybe um, a new part was reborn. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> I want to see a, what is a mash like? drill. Um, it is drill. Yeah, We're so, getting commentary yeah. here. Drill music okay. from the south of Chicago. Okay. Thanks, Analia. Thanks, Julia. Thanks, guys. Type of trap. Okay, got it. I learned something new today as well. But Lisa, what's it like, like lecturing and all these universities? Okay, so guys, Lisa is amazing. She has lectured at like Columbia, Prince, MIT, Oxford, Cambridge. I don't know. You name it, she's been there. So, but like, what's it like after like never, you know, 14 years old, you're like school, I don't know. Nobody's watching, not going to go. And now you're like lecturing at the biggest universities in the world. Um. Yeah, I mean, look, I suppose the proof will be in the pudding with my poor students. So, but I, I do like um, making Beckett accessible, mm. and uh, there there is an urgency that a performer brings to the work that mm -hmm. simply isn't, and a specificity 
that simply isn't there. Uh, and also just, to, yeah, and I'm talking about like a forensic urgency mm -hmm. that isn't there in the uh, luxurious position of academic conjecture. Mm -hmm. um, so when I stand on a stage, I know whether I'm holding a sword or a blade mm -hmm. of straw. And I need to know when you're in front of thousands of people, it's only then that you really need to know where you are in the text. And so I really need to be super armed with an understanding of each work that I perform. And wow. so I take a very natural academic approach to it anyway. But it has me meant that I've, I've delved very, very deep into the work mm -hmm. um, out of necessity. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe the only other academic comparison is a PhD viva that people would have or a snooty book review in a periodical. But, you know, the fear of a thousand people and you not knowing exactly what you're saying and why you're saying it um, is is that scrutiny is is pretty uh, you know hot under the collar. It's pretty intense. Yeah, I, mean, and I guess so, in a way it's kind um, of like conforming. You could compare well, it. Yeah. If you yeah. describe it like that, um, standing a thousand people, it's like a one woman show all over again. <laughs> well, yeah, but it it does mean that when you are performing those works, that you have to really know your onions, as my father mm -hmm. would say, and so. Um, in a way, each each little, you know, my performance of Not I is almost like a PhD in Not I, you know, um, mm, and right. and so I I was able to kind of bypass a lot of my own uh, inner critics by, um, you know, a resolution that I knew what I was talking about, um, and in a very visceral way. Um, but nonetheless, those institutions can be intimidating and. What I wanted to um, provide the students was not another ivory gate, but, in, but an invitation to find their own personal purchase into the work that would ignite the imagination and uh, passions of these um, young students. And, mm -hmm. um, and that's really how I kind of a approach the work. I've just finished a course teaching them. Um, the um, Antigone in Princeton and um, a few years at Columbia and NYU and, You're amazing. and really MIT. Cool. Um, but I love it. I really love it. I wouldn't want to do it full time, but I do. <laughs> Just for the record, for the record. Mm. And how, I know, I know we're getting close, close to the end here, but there's just a couple more questions I really want to ask. And that's one of them would be like, you're three weeks away from giving birth, right? So how was it like being on set? Like, were you, you know, how did you feel? Were you nervous to tell people you were pregnant? I know it can be really like man visto in Spanish. They say like bad, badly seen, you know, you're, you, yeah. all these, everything you said about women and assumptions and people putting stuff on you and every, like, how did that come, come to a, did it come to a pinnacle, I guess, when you? Yeah, so I discovered pregnant. on Christmas yeah. day, I was pregnant and um, oh. already I've entered a new category. Um, I am what they call a geriatric mother. Okay. It's actually written on some form I have here. I should frame it. Anyway, um, it was a surprise-ish and um, a welcome one. And um, wow. I mean, COVID was one of the best things that ever happened to me because you remember I was on a plane crossing that Atlantic twice like a every month. Every week. And, yeah. 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 And, um, and, COVID grounded me and right. centered me and introduced me to, um, you know, the big love of my life as well. And just that idea of having a home, you know, wow. I was talked about this idea of home, having left home at 14. And, right. And, and being on the road ever since, I, basically. Yeah, basically. Yeah. And, um, and so it grounded me and it, and yet, because we all, are just ferociously creative you know it's amazing how we've all got through this look at what you're doing now you know um but you know i started teaching immediately online mm -hmm. um i wow. i you know and, and and the productions that have been made and got through this whole period i just commend anyone who's managed to get anything done it's it's extraordinary and how we've all got through it is really 
a, you know, testament to our chutzpah and uh, our creativity and our drive and, I, you know, but um, I, I, I discovered on Christmas Day that I was pregnant and I thought, oh my God, and, and the dates kept shifting for um, Top Boy shooting and um, another, another TV series that I had just finished as well and and um, I thought, how am I going to do this? And, you know, particularly in Top Boy, I'm meant to be this kind of milf or, you know, I, uh, <laughs> uh, things were going to start changing. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and then I thought, the play, how am I going to do the play? And then I remembered, hang on, Winnie is buried up to her waist. It's fine. What are the dangers? I could overheat, which I knew an awful lot of actresses had because the lights are so intense in that play. And I would struggle with baby brain and memory. So I'll just have to work harder, right? That's, I'll oh just have God. to work harder. Wow. So um, wow. I started learning the play straight away. So that my memory wouldn't be compromised. Right. Um, and, um, and I could counteract the fact that most of my blood cells were needed elsewhere. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and, um, and then I... I was so nervous telling the guys and they were amazing. I, they, they rocked up the next day I was on set, all the producers and the writer, and the writer had his laptop with him and he said, why don't we just write it into the script? Wow. And there on a bench, just before we shot a scene, it was written into the script. Wow. And then they worked around wow. it. And so while I was rehearsing Happy Days, I had to fly wow. to Spain to shoot um, and they put all my scenes together that I would work really intensely for a few days so they could shoot me out <laughs> before um, I wasn't able to get on the plane again. You know, right. you can only, right. yeah. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so, so that wow. was done and, and, and wow. the, the theater let me go for a week in order to do that. And I do have to say there's like a great comment here that huh? Lisa's officially a MILF in three weeks, basically. Somebody did. <laughs> <laughs> I had to read that one. I had to read that. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but like they, like the TV company and the theater company, work together to try and make it all work. And oh my God. I've, I've just been blown. And you know what's so exciting? You'd kind of think, here we are, two thousand years or so in existence. That you know, they're always talking about overpopulation and mm -hmm. blah blah blah. And, Mm -hmm. uh, the looming recession and all the bleakness that we've lived through recently, but also the recession that's about to hit us and global climate crises. And, and yet you tell someone you're pregnant and they just light up. Just this kind of unbridled life. enthusiasm life. for one more life. Wow. I have to say, I have found that so heartwarming. Wow. And it is the most extraordinary thing playing a role of a woman who's in her midlife, um, contemplating death, um, contemplating so much relationships in life, and she's buried up to her waist. And underneath this mound, my little one, um, whose nickname is Thumper, because she just kicks all the time, it's like thumping Thumper! away. <laughs> um, is... is, is um, is 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 there bursting with life? It is the most extraordinary and very um, centering in a way. Um, wow! Um, yeah, it really is. It really is. Lisa, I have two Amazing. more things to ask. One is for my dad. He's a huge fan of yours, and uh, he asked me to ask. I said, if you had one question you could ask Lisa, what would it be? And he was like, <laughs> thought about it for a second, and then he said. Ask her to describe God. <laughs> I'm just passing Jesus. that on. <laughs> well, you said Jesus. Is that a description right there? Are we done? No, no, no it isn't. It definitely isn't. As a as a recovering Irish Catholic, um, I didn't find much God there, quite frankly. But um, you can always pass. I'm just I'm passing I'm passing along the the question step. <laughs> You can come, we can come back. I should have asked this at the beginning and then come back to it at the end. Yeah. I look, I have time. loads, I, you know, I'm what you might call a just in caser. If I had any kind of faith, I'll be open to anything. 
And I do, you know, I'm reading The Odyssey at the moment, which is amazing, Emily Wilson's translation. And what's so fantastic about how the gods appear and that they are shapeshifters, they, particularly Athena, she, mm-hmm. she appears in, in, mm-hmm. in maiden girls, appears as young soldiers, she appears as a, as a poet, she appears as a bird. Mm. And I, I kind of feel that the Greeks maybe had it, had it right there, that mm. they are, that God is a shapeshifter. Mm. And when I think about the people who've come into my life, and words of wisdom that comes out of someone's mouth for five minutes and then I might never see them again. Or someone who comes up to me and says, go that way, or points that direction. I feel like um, I'm open to it being anything. Sometimes God is in a, a looming sky or the last stubborn vestiges of a blossom that's refusing to to let go over, you know, um, uh, you know, end of end of April last year when things were so mm. goddamn bleak for all of us, and um, I I I often think the way I find it there is by thinking of others and getting out of self, mm-hmm. um, and that's when I feel a little bit more connected under the lights, of course. In as I say, when you are true to yourself and get out of your own way and try and be a vehicle and put yourself at service. Something almost transcendental happens there. I find talking about God so embarrassing. Um, but because um, it's impossible, it's too large to kind yeah. of conjure. And anytime you try and capture it, mm-hmm. you sound like, God forbid, Eckhart Tolle like or some sort of... Um, <laughs> no, but I know what you're saying. Buddhist All those little things, that you, you know. You can't yeah, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and um, essentially, I think it's just goodness, isn't it? And, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. In in indigenous, some indigenous cultures, my dad is from the Cree Cree Soto of the prairies here. It's all my relations. Every it's kind of what you're saying that all, everything is related. Everything is interconnected. We are all each other, the trees, the skies, the clouds, ourselves, other people, everything. Well, Beckett says, um, we are all of one mind. Deep down, we're all of one mind. Mm. And deep down, we're fond of one another. And I do, I do, you know, and I, I also believe that the dead are among us. I really feel that strongly. Mm. Um, I don't know, is it a, a, a genetic awakening at the moment, but I feel my grandmother, who I never even met, so wow. much part of this whole recent experience with, um, you know, wow. uh, I, 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 you know, it was a, the, the performance that I gave in Happy Days was sort of a medley of the the, the dead, of the Duan dead. And, um, wow. and it, it just feels extraordinary and I don't know if that is because certain mm. genetic structures are being tugged at at the moment with thumper down below or who knows you know but um it, it is extraordinary extraordinary there's there's a fantastic um David Eagleman wrote this book called Some which I mm. did the audio book for um he's a neurophysicist but he um describes as himself as a poscopelian um, that he believes in the possibility of everything. Uh, and, uh, I, love I, I, I love that too. Yeah. I think I'm going to be that. I think that I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take that on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. I mean, I could just talk to you for hours and hours and hours and hours and forever. But also one final request, if you would consider maybe reciting something for us before you go. Um, if not... We'll and maybe person. God is a bit like um, love and, you know, Beckett was so shy of anything sentimental, but this poem of his, I I read at Billy Whitelow's um, funeral and it was her favourite poem and it wow. has become mine. It's called um, Cascando. Wow. Why not merely the despaired of? occasion of wordshed is it not better abort than be barren 
The hours after you are gone are so leaden. They will always start dragging too soon. The grapples clawing blindly the bed of want, bringing up the bones, the old loves, sockets filled once with eyes like yours. Oh, always. Is it better too soon than never? The black want splashing their faces, saying again, nine days never floated the loved. Nine months and our nine lives, saying again, if you do not teach me, I shall not learn. Saying again, there is a last, even of last times, last times of begging, last times of loving, of knowing, not knowing, pretending. A last even of last times of saying, if you do not love me, I shall not be loved. If I do not love you, I shall not love. The churn of stale words in the heart again. Love, love, love. Thud of the old plunger, pestling the unalterable way of words. Terrified again of not loving. Of loving and not you. Of being loved and not by you. Of knowing, not knowing, pretending. Pretending. I and all the others that will love you, if they love you. Unless they love you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. What an honor to speak with you. Thank you, everybody. Shirley, you know Shirley. We met Thank you at the same time. Ah, Shirley! Yeah. Sending you lots yeah. of love. <laughs> Lisa, you're incredible. You're amazing. Thank you so much. Have Is there you. anything that we missed Thank that you, you feel like you need to get across or anything at all? No. Just want to. No. Yeah. You're incredible. For those of you who are asking, yes, it will be saved. Come rewatch. Let's just sending all our love across the ocean. All my love to you and to Thumper. <laughs> I just you. cannot wait. I'm so excited for you. And oh, thank you. My goodness. I can't wait for her to hear your incredible voice. <laughs> um, Anytime. You Call me. are an extraordinary <laughs> powerhouse. Yeah. Well, 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 all I can say is the same about you. <laughs> thank you, Lisa. You're just the best. Love you so much. Have a gorgeous, beautiful too. day. Thank you so Take much. Care, and I can't wait to see <laughs> to see you next time. Bye. Oh, Take care. Have Bye. a beautiful day. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.